Welcome to Elevate Uplift's Community Dialogue Series, centering healing advocacy and services. The Elevate Uplift Project seeks to deepen and broaden the lessons learned from the National Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative Project and engage with organizations to change practices and expand their understanding of healing. Elevate Uplift offers opportunities to help survivor serving agencies, state, territorial, tribal coalitions, and funding administrators to think critically about how they do their work and to make the changes necessary to provide comprehensive and sustainable support for survivors. That includes establishing practices and services rooted in anti-racism and anti-oppression frameworks, learning strategies for building empowering leadership, creating intentional organizational identity, engaging in impactful community organizing and movement building, and expanding knowledge of sexual violence and healing. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. It's great to uh, have this opportunity to spend some time with you talking about our nervous system. So many of you, I'm assuming, um, know or have heard that trauma is the kind of experience that impacts not just our knowledge base and our knowledge of our environment, what's safe, what isn't, but it impacts our emotional being as well as our body, our nervous system. So what I hope to do in this dialogue today is to just give you a general overview of what happens to our nervous system when we experience trauma and what can we do to support it. So first of all, we know that our nervous system is responsible for keeping us safe. And actually that's the only purpose of our nervous system is to sense through our body when we are in danger. It senses that we're in danger and it goes into what we know as a sympathetic response. The sympathetic response says, we're in danger. I pick up that we're in danger and I want you to be safe. So during this time when I'm picking up that you're in danger, in order to gain a sense of safety, let's go into fight, flight, or freeze. And it's an automatic setup. It's totally automatic. It's not a choice. When we are in danger, our nervous system sends out signals that says, Santa, stay safe. And whether I go into fight, flight, or freeze is actually not up to me. It's up to the nervous system to assess what is, what is most likely going to keep me safe. Yeah, that is also a short term experience. Our nervous system goes into the sympathetic response. And when it gains reestablishing a sense of safety, when our body nervous system stops sending out the signals that we're endangered, then it goes back to this parasympathetic response of being able to breathe and be calm and feel safe. And so again, it's an automatic and autotomic response to threats. What happens, unfortunately, is that for some of us, the trauma that we have experienced is such that even though our nervous system has this mechanism of going to fight, flight, or freeze, because we have not been able to regain a sense of safety, and we know that unfortunately, survivors of sexual abuse are one of the few um, people who experience trauma that gets re-experienced over and over again. And that is because whether we re-experience it just because we're in a world that targets us 
or we re-experience it because it's lodged in our bodies and can easily be triggered, right? We re-experience it because it's lodged in our bodies and we can easily re-experience it. So unfortunately, because of that, by the time our nervous system goes into uh, the sympathetic or parasympathetic response, whichever one, there's another event because the nervous system doesn't really understand time. It doesn't have a sense of time. It just knows that it is sensing something that feels like danger and it reacts. Right? So if you are indeed experiencing a traumatic event, guess what happens? It reacts. If you're remembering a traumatic exp experience, it reacts. If you're having a trigger, a flashback, right? If you're anticipating being in a situation that's similar, and unfortunately, again, in issues of sexual abuse, um, particularly, but not, not only childhood sexual abuse, the dynamics of the relationship, the sense of um, lack of power, the being exposed to people who abuse you, but were also your authority figures. So you can imagine that as we walk our life, so we walk in the world, we encounter lots of experiences where authority, where we get to deal with authority, we experience dealing with um, situations that are aggressive, we experience all kinds of situations, right? So that even if you're not literally being abused, again, your body picks up that you're being abused again. And it goes back into this cycle of, oh, I know what to do, go into fight, flight, or freeze until the danger passes, right? But the danger does not pass. That's the problem. It does sometimes, but most often, particularly when we're talking about communities of color, we're constantly exposed to danger. So the danger really doesn't pass. And again, your nervous system can't distinguish. Is this an event that happened right now? Was this yesterday? Was this three years ago? Is this something I'm anticipating? It really doesn't distinguish that. So we're caught in this cycle of fight, flight, freeze, and never finding a place where we can actually rest and feel safe. What that does to a system is that it begins to then challenge our system's innate ability to regulate itself. It challenges the system's innate ability to find regulation because it is constantly caught in this loop. The other thing that does is that throughout time of being caught in this loop, we begin to develop what is known as habitual responses to trauma. Habitual responses are your go-to. So I said a moment ago, whether your nervous system chooses fight, flight, or freeze is not up to us, right? But if the nervous system has, if, if the nervous system has created a neural pathway, a path, a road, that it's used to traveling every time you experience a sense of um, danger, then guess what? That's the road most traveled. And so now, every time I get triggered, every time I anticipate danger, every time I remember danger, I automatically, they call it the habitual response to trauma. I automatically go into whatever has been most resourceful. Not enough to bring me back to a place of regulation, but most resourceful. So now I have a habitual response to trauma. And after a while, those habitual responses to trauma some people would say they become part of your personality. I don't think it becomes part of your personality, but it does become part of an automatic go-to. 
that begins to inform how you live in your body. So for example, if I have experienced so much trauma, real, perceived, imagined, remembered, doesn't matter. If I have experienced so much trauma and my habitual response is fight, and maybe my habitual response is fight because I also grew up in a home where there was danger, where there was threat, and what they used in that system was fight response, right? So I'm already predisposed. Then I have my own experience of trauma. I automatically go to, automatically, autonomically go to whatever feels like it's gonna give me the most sense of safety. And then after a while of, again, perceived, remembered, imagined threats or real threats, now I go automatically to fight. So what I was saying a moment ago about it's not a personality change, but it is the sense of um, how I navigate the world. As a person who responds to threat from a fight response, I am irritable. I am short-tempered. I am very sensitive. I get easily angry. I am, so you can imagine, I'm in a fight. I'm in a constant fight. I am very oppositional and sometimes just slightly unnoticeable and sometimes quite obvious, right? One of the things that I normally ask um, clients when they come to see me is, one of the first things is, do you notice, do you know what your habitual response to threat is? And some people are aware and some aren't. But the question becomes, what is your general sense of being? What is your general sense of being? Are you stuck in freeze? A freeze response, habitual response to freeze, will be what you can imagine. It's depression. It's immobility. It's lack of interest. It's lack of motivation. It's low sense of self. It's lots of sadness. It's that kind of energy. So if you walk in the world with that kind of energy, you may be stuck in a freeze response. Flee, same thing, obvious. A person who's stuck in a flee response is a person who has a hard time being still, multitasking, hyperactive, lots of things at the same time, can't commit, doesn't want to commit, um, et cetera, et cetera. I have a lot to do. I'm moving fast. I'm talking fast. I don't want to settle on any one thing. Um, that is someone that is probably stuck in a flea response. Now, we all have all of these characters, which is why I don't necessarily like saying that it causes a personality change after a while, but it is something for us to pay attention to, right? So now that we have that, now that we have a general sense of, yes, I'm a trauma survivor, um, and here are the ways in which I automatically respond to sensing threat, then we can begin to work on helping ourselves and helping those that we serve, those that we work, understand why they respond the way they respond, right? I have clients who constantly want to, want to ask and ask, why is it that when I feel threatened, when I'm scared, I can't move? Why is it that when I was violated, I couldn't fight or I couldn't speak, right? And part of that is because you're in freeze. And in freeze, the state of freeze says, you try to fight. And again, I'm talking about neurologically, whether you've done this or not, literally is a different story. But your system tried to fight. It could not find a sense of safety. Your system tried to flee and it could not run fast enough. So your system went into freeze. And really freeze is a state, it's a holding place. It's a place to be while you're waiting 
for the danger to pass, assuming that it's not going to pass. Right? You've tried fighting, you've tried running, it's not passing. So you prepare to actually die. You prepare to desensitize. Another um, characteristic of being stuck in freeze response is disassociation, right? You prepare to leave the event because it's too much to tolerate. Trauma in our body is an experience that was untolerable. It rendered your system captive to something that you were not supposed to be able to tolerate, right? So when you have ran and you have fought, you then decide, and again, it's not you, it's, and I'll explain to you in another way why we know it's not you. Then you decide to be quiet, to go inward, to be really still, to detach, so that you don't have to continue to feel the overwhelming experience of the trauma. One of the other things that happens when you experience trauma is that our brain, there are three major parts to our brain and they each have their primary function. So our neocortex, which is the biggest part of our brain that rests somewhere at the, at the front lobe, is the part of our brain that's responsible for all kinds of information, processing, understanding, analyzing, um, how-tos, all information that requires cognition comes from the neocortex part of our brain. Then there is the limbic brain. Is that right? Yes, the limbic brain is the center part of our brain that is responsible for emotions, for processing everything that's emotional. So we've got neocortex, we've got limbic, and I'm blocking out on the back part of our brain. It'll come to me in a moment. Um, so the neocortex is thoughts. The limbic brain is emotional process. And then there's this last part in the back of your brain that's responsible for sensation. So one can say that your neocortex speaks the language of words. Your limbic system speaks the language of emotions. And your reptilian brain, someone wrote, thank you. That's right. There's another word for it, but I can't think of it right now, but that does it. The reptilian brain is responsible for what you're sensing in your body. It's the part of your brain that tells you, yeah, that you're in danger. It's the part of your brain that says, whoa, that was hot, right? It's the part of your brain that says, move away. Um, it's a part of your brain that acts automatically, again, to keep you safe. So when we are in danger, guess what? You don't need to think. You need to act, react, move fast, right? So the neocortex automatically goes offline. You don't need it. The limbic brain automatically goes, goes offline. You don't need to be thinking about how sad it is that your child is about to fall out a window. You don't need to think about that. You just need to act, right? And so we're left with our reptilian brain. Another reason why when you experience trauma, you don't have access to all of your memory. A really important piece uh, for those of us who work with survivors to understand that sometimes the stories will change. Sometimes the memory won't be there at all. Just the body memory is there, but there's no cognition. And that explains some of that, or maybe even all of that, right? So we're, we're clear about this system that's supposed to be protecting us, right? And we're clear about that system is stuck. It is not getting to that place where it can rest. It is not getting to that place of parasympathetic. It's just continuing to go in a circle of activation, right? So what, one moment to show a demonstration. So imagining that this is my nervous system, what is supposed to be 
expanding and contracting, right, into parasympathetic or activation to being resourced and coming back to that place of feeling safe is now out here all the time because it never got to come back to a place of resource, right? And any event that happens can easily create what we then call a trauma rupture where all of these little pieces will fly around. I know that uh, Taylor has a message for us. Thanks, Hi, uh, yeah, if we could just pause for a brief moment for our interpreters, please. Yes. Good time to also take some breaths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that reminder as well. Okay, I think we're okay. Excellent. Let's get started again. Thank you, Santa. Yeah, I wonder if at this point there are any questions um, in our chat box that I could respond to before we move on to the second part, which is, so what do we do? Uh, let's see. Nope, there doesn't seem to be anything in the chat box. So I will continue then. Um, so what do we do? What do we do when our nervous system is so um, activated yeah, that it is hard to find a place of comfort, safety, peace? Right? So the most important thing, I think, is realizing that um, these techniques work once the trauma is over. Not the trauma, I'm sorry, the incident, the incident. These techniques work when the incident is over, because while the incident is going on, your body's going to do what your body feels it needs to do. Your nervous system is going to do what it feels it needs to do. Yeah. But once the actual event is over, and remember that the event could be um, a real traumatic event, perceived, imagined, remembered, sensed, yeah, anticipated. Once the event is over, how do we how do we help our nervous systems to find a place of regulation? So it becomes a practice. It becomes a practice of intentionally what is supposed to happen automatically and autonomically, right? Coming from activation to deactivation is not happening. The work and the healing of the, of the nervous system happens by us deciding that from now on, we're going to start creating a new neural pathway, a new neural pathway, so that when I feel the beginnings of what I recognize over time is my body going into activation instead of just letting it happen or instead of stopping it, which is actually what a lot of us do. Oh, I can't feel that now. I need to shut it down, stop it, right? Instead of doing that, we begin to create and provoke what is natural to our nervous system, yeah? So we begin to provoke. So step number one requires learning, learning your body, learning your body. So somatic experiencing the work of regulating your nervous system can only happen if you're aware of your body. So noticing the body. I know that when I have my shoulders up here and I didn't do it intentionally, I'm getting anxious. I also know that I have a tendency of tightening my stomach. I know that my jaw starts to tighten up. For some people is they open their eyes and they become more attentive. 
For some people, it may be chills. For some people, it may be a pain in their back. Like we all have different ways of processing, this doesn't feel comfortable. Sometimes it's chills, right? So the first step is spending time really noticing the sensations in your body. Do I feel full or empty? Do I feel big or small? Do I feel light or dark? Do I feel um, lengthening or shortening? Do I feel um, things crawling down my body? Like, what is it that I feel? What are the sensations? And by the way, we know the sensations of what happens when we're happy and joyful and not threatened. And we note the sensations of what happens when we're feeling threatened, right? So that is the first step, is beginning to really spend time. This is something that we can do in meditation or you can do in your everyday life. Like what happens when you get bad news? What happens when you're excited about something? What happens when you're going on an interview and you've got butterflies in your stomach? Do those butterflies show up always when you're nervous or only on interviews, right? So you begin to really get to know your body, first step, so that you can detect when there's something that feels off in your body. And the wonderful thing is that if you're wrong, you're wrong, nothing lost. We're working on creating this pathway, right? This neural pathway that allows you to, instead of going into the automatic response, to interrupt the process, interrupt the process of going into the parasympathetic response and instead create, manipulate the situation so that you create a sense of, ah, I can actually relax, yeah? That's the goal. The goal is to begin to notice what's happening in my body. I don't know why, but I just know that my stomach is tightening up. I don't know why, but I feel shortness of breath. I don't know why. But in that moment, I am going to assume that those signals, and remember, I have some sense of what the signals may be based on knowing what my habitual response to trauma is. So I have some sense that something's off. Instead of automatically going into a fight, flight, or freeze response, I am going to say, okay, Santa, let's watch that. Your body's telling you something's up, something's happening. And instead of automatically responding, let's have that sensation, those sensations be simply a sign that says, or a bell that rings that says, Santa assessed for danger. So the second thing in the process is assessing for danger. How do we assess for danger? I tune into what I'm hearing. I look around, maybe I'm in my home and everything's okay, but I just had a trigger or a flashback or a memory or something flashed on television that reminded me of something. My body starts to respond because there's, there's that most traveled neural pathway of Santa, when you're in danger, go into fight, flight or freeze. This time instead, I am going to say, notice, notice what's in your environment. By the way, there's a nerve called the ventral vagal nerve that's also connected to that reptilian brain that says something like, I get fed, the ventral vagal nerve gets fed through the eyes, that's science. So when I focus my eyes and not just focus like hypervigilantly looking for things, but when I focus my eyes, at something and start to look at the details. If you were looking at this, you wouldn't see the mass. You would see that these are all little pieces connected to each other. You would notice the different colors, right? You would notice 
the ease with which this moves in and out. Now you've connected with this thing. And what happens through your eyes and your ventral vagal nerve is that when you connect with things, automatically the ventral vagal nerve says, oh, I belong here, I'm a part of this. And immediately there's a little bit of regulation that happens. So again, when I'm sensing something off in my body that reminds me of what happens to me when I'm about to go into fight, flight, or freeze, the first thing is to say to myself, orient yourself to the space that you're in, both to remind myself I'm in a safe place, but more importantly, to let my eyes connect with things and have that ventral vagal nerve send the message that I am a part of. I'm a part of what's going on here. I feel safe. I belong here. Yeah. So orienting. While you're orienting to space, continue to track. Tracking would be the language that's used for be, continue to notice how your body's responding. Yeah. So you track what's happening in your body. Perhaps it confirms the habitual desire to move or to run or to say something or to snap or to sleep, whatever it is, right? But you notice that. You notice that and leave time to really be with that, right? So while you're noticing it, there's an intent to notice. There is not only an intent, but there's an action of noticing. Yeah. So you're becoming more embodied as you're noticing. The next thing to begin to identify then are options of what resources you. What will go or what will help your nervous system go from this to this? Resources are many things and resources are always available. Now, when we talk about resources here, they could be services, that that's a form of resource. Um, but really what I'm talking about when I talk about resources are things that automatically get your nervous system to say, oh, okay, we're safe again. So resources can be sensations. Maybe there's a touch that helps you to feel comforting. Right? And you guys may want to try on your own now. Maybe there's a touch. Yeah. Maybe some people like the feel of lotion in their hands. Maybe it's ice. Maybe it's heat. There's so many different kinds of sensations. Maybe it's touching something soft. Maybe it's holding something that's solid like a little stone, yeah? Something that has weight. This is another stone, yeah? This is a stone that has weight, but it's also really soft, yeah? So sensations can be resources. Imagery can be resources. So imagery could be anything. Imagine whatever you want. Remember when I said earlier, the nervous system does not have a sense of intelligence. It's the reptilian brain for a reason. Yeah. And because it doesn't have intelligence, it only senses, it only speaks the language of sensation. If you go into an imagery, imagined real or not real, fantasy, whatever, and you're actually there experiencing that, the nervous system doesn't know that it's all in your head. It doesn't know that you just made it up. It picks up the sensation that that particular imagery gives you, yeah? So you can imagine anything that gives you the sensation of feeling powerful, of feeling relaxed, or feeling happy, yeah? Use your imagination to create as many of those possibilities as possible. My particular imagery that always works is I imagine being at a beach and I have my own 
private separate space. I could hear the water, I could hear children playing, I can hear music, but everything's at a distance. And I'm over here in my little part of the beach and I'm actually laying in this beautiful um, canopy with lots of white flowing sheets. Yeah. And I could just be there and close my eyes and feel the breeze and smell whatever I want to smell and hear the sounds and relax into that canopy. Yeah, that's my imagery. So you can create whatever imagery works for you. You can also create behaviors, right? And we know people say, oh, I go for a walk, it feels better. I jump, it feels better. I take a bath, it feels better. Um, I read a book, I do something with my hands, right? I call a friend. Like, what are the many behaviors that help you feel, help give you the sensation, yeah? So the, the, the trick here or the challenge here is that it's not just thinking about it. I had someone ask me once, oh, so this is like heavy duty meditation and visualization. I said, well, it can be, but it's not just about visualizing or imagining something. It's about actually transporting yourself there. How many senses can you engage in your visualization or in your imagery? Yeah. How many of those senses can you engage so that the nervous system thinks it went on a trip and actually it didn't, right? But it thinks it did. It got all the benefits from the beach or whatever it was you were doing, the hiking. So sensations, imagery, behaviors. Um, there's also memory. Like you can bring up a memory of something you've done in the past, that a time in your life when things were safe, where things felt good, when you felt strong and happy and resilient. Yeah. So I advise creating a list creating a list of what are those things? Who are those people? What are those activities or imageries or photos, right? I have a client who has flashcards. On one side is the word that is their resource. And on the other side, they have a picture that reminds them of that. Because sometimes when we're so activated, it's hard to remember. It's actually hard to remember that one can be safe. Yeah. So after identifying what your resources are, you pick one. You pick one, you hang out there with it, and you continue. Remember, this is a continuous piece of continuing to track. You continue to track. How is my body responding? Responding. Is my breath any deeper? Do I feel more relaxed? Is the tension gone from my jaw? Right? So for yourself, there's a couple of things going on. One is that you are now traveling the less traveled neural pathway. You're creating. We're having an experience. We're out of the threat physically. We're no longer under threat in the moment. Yeah. Maybe it's years later, days later, whatever. Something triggers it memory, anything. There's so many things that trigger us, right? Something triggers you and you start to feel the sensation in your body. And because you've been practicing being more aware of sensations in your body, you recognize, oh, well, I wonder why I haven't been breathing as deeply. Or I wonder why I haven't been looking at people in the face. Or I wonder why, whatever it is, right, for you. You realize that, oh, I think I'm getting activated. I don't know why. Immediately, you go to your orientation. Let's look around to what's familiar in this space, right? Letting that, that sensation, those sensations that are coming up that you're tracking, be just a bell that says, assess for danger. And in your assessing, you're gonna look around you're going to familiarize yourself with what's there. If you're alone in the house while you're having one of these events, you may even look around and actually clear the space. You know how cops would say, clear, 
you clear the space, you, you give yourself whatever it is you need to feel literally cognitively safe, right? And that happens through the tracking. You engage that ventral vagal nerve by looking at things and the details of things. You have a list of habitual responses, fight, flight, or freeze, but you don't go to fight, flight, or freeze. You can do one or two things in the healing process. One is you can just notice. Notice the desire to go into fight, flight, or freeze. What does that do? That helps you to create capacity, right? So next time you experience a similar sensation in your body, you're not so quick to go into automatic fight, flight, or freeze. You can tolerate it, right? So we develop the capacity to tolerate more. Yeah. And the moment it feels like you don't want to be with it anymore, the discomfort in your body, the moment it begins to feel like, oh, I got to stop this or, you know, interrupt this process. I don't want to do this anymore because it's actually not helping. It's a sign that you've had enough, right? That is then the time. And that could be a second later or that could be 10 minutes later. But that is the time when you say, okay, Taylor, it's time for you to resource, yeah? And you go to your list and you pick a resource and let's give our interpreters time to catch up. Thank you. Thank you, Santa. Okay, I think we're good. Wonderful. So again, you resource because you have a list of things you can pick from. So you pick one. It works great. It calms you down. Wonderful. Right? You're, you're visiting that new neural pathway, which by the way, whatever it is you use the most is where you go the most. Right? So you use that new neural pathway. And you realize that, again, you're always orienting to your body that, oh, I feel better. I'm a little bit more relaxed. Great. It worked. You reorient to the same space you were in when this started. Yeah. You get a little bit more orientation or a little bit more sense of uh, feeling safe or, or deactivation because now you've oriented again through your eyes, you've looked around, you feel safe, yeah? And you're done, you're healed. <laughs> no, you're not healed, right? But this is what begins the process. This is how we begin to regulate our nervous system, yeah? You begin to create the experience. So all we're doing is undoing this. That's what we're doing. We're undoing that's being stuck here or here. This would be freeze. Yeah. By each time you have what it feels like, oh, I'm getting really scared, uncomfortable, I feel threatened, interrupting this process, orienting, assessing for danger, noticing what's happening in your body, creating capacity so you may want to stay here and feel the uncomfortability. Yeah, we call that titrating. You go from feeling uncomfortability to resourcing. Feeling uncomfortability to resourcing. Yeah, I like um, describing it. I grew up in New York City where we got lots of snow. And I remember parallel parking and being stuck in the ice and needing to like pendulate or needing to drive forward and back, forward and back to create enough space to be able to literally drive out. So that's what this does, right? You're feeling the activation. You're staying with it for a moment. You're recognizing it. It's happening. I'm feeling threatened, but there is no threat because I've already assessed the situation. I'm gonna stay here and just get familiar with that uncomfortable experience a little bit at a time. And the moment you find yourself getting distracted 
from the uncomfortable sensations in your body, it's time to bring in a resource. You bring in a resource, we're shifting the automatic response. You're provoking the, I feel safer now. I feel more comfortable now. Yeah. And you do that over and over again. What happens over time, number one, you have greater capacity to tolerate uncomfortable experiences. And number two, you begin to actually create a pathway that says, when I feel any sense of threat, not only do I have the capacity to tolerate more and more, but I know how to bring myself back to regulation. Just knowing that, just knowing that I won't get stuck there. I know how to pendulate in and out by using my resources, yeah? If you're using this as a, um, as a therapist, as a healer, as someone who's providing services to a trauma survivor, you do the same thing. The only difference in that particular case, difference in that particular case, is that maybe you'll stay longer and longer in the let's create capacity, right? Um, what that looks like also is if someone's sharing a story with you about their traumatic event, no, you don't let them tell you the story all over again, because that's just re-traumatizing, right? The story has to be told with a lot of risk in it, a lot of pendulating, right? So when someone is telling me a trauma story, I am consistently interrupting to say, how are you? Are you still aware? Are you still conscious? Even while they're sobbing, are you here? Are you present, right? I am constantly engaging them to engage with their body, to keep tracking, yeah? So we take little pieces, I call it titrating. We take little pieces at a time of the traumatic story and stay with it right? Let's regulate that one experience. So as, as someone is sharing an experience of trauma, I'm hearing for where is the energy that requires fight, flight, or freeze? Like where is a part of the story where I can see, and you'll be able to see and also feel where you're getting caught, that's the time to introduce a resource, right? That's the time to come back to regulation and then continue with the story. I am looking as they're telling the story for those moments when I could see that the breath stops, when I could see that there's something involuntary wanting to happen, right? Or what is always a fact is when I ask the person, how are you? Oh, this is overwhelming. This is too much. Well, then let's let's dial it down a little bit. We can. We can dial it down. Oh, it's okay. I can keep telling you the story. All right. Well, then let's dial it up just a little bit. But noticing what's happening in your body is essential. Being able to track what's happening is what's going to give you the freedom. And what we're really trying to do is to master what has been unfortunately um, the mechanism that's supposed to work but has been affected by the trauma. Remember also when I was talking about the different parts of the brain, that the other thing that happens is when you're regulated, then you can begin to have more access to your neocortex and to begin to make decisions, you can begin to feel more functional. You can begin to realize that um, you're not going to fight, flight, or freeze because that's what you do. You're going into fight, flight, or freeze because that's what you do to feel safe. So what if there was another way of creating a sense of safety? Yeah. What if there were other ways? How much more access would we then have, again, to our neocortex, which always makes us feel better, being able to think, being able to have um, 
access to our, our consciousness around thinking helps us feel safer, yeah? Um, what are the questions? I'm reading um, something in the chat box. This is what other questions can I ask to check in with victim when listening to the story or the, other than how are you? Are you aware? Are you aware of your body? What's happening in your body right now? And they may think, well, I'm telling you this story. In the middle of the story, you want, yes, I do. I want to know what's happening in your body. Yeah, I want to know. And I'll ask what's happening in their body. And then I'll also follow up with, how's your breath? Are you feeling any tightness anywhere? Do you want to do something about relaxing that part of your body? Right? So the key is to get them to come back to tracking in their body. Yeah? And the purpose is so that we can know when to introduce the idea of a resource. When to say, well, you know, that's that's enough, that's a lot. Let's take a break. And the break is not just a break to go to the restroom. The break is a break to introduce a resource, yeah? You may also find yourself introducing your clients to resources. So in my office, <clears throat> excuse me, in my office, I keep, as I have shown you, I keep all kinds of gadgets and things most of which I use for myself, right? Because I'm in this too. I'm in this with you. <laughs> and, um, but also to be able to offer it to, to the client um, as a try this, smell this, hold this. What about some Play-Doh? What about some paper? What about doodling? What about whatever brings you back in an intentional way, yeah? Um, there's a question here that says, is it considered a fight or freeze response when someone suppresses their emotions and willingness? The ability to discuss a traumatic response. Is that considered a fight or freeze response? It depends, right? I want to look at, um, because really the only reason why fight and freeze and flee responses, why that talk is even important is because it explains a person's behavior, right? So someone who just thinks like, you know, I don't know, I'm experienced as argumentative, now knows why. One of the reasons, there may be others, right? So it's not so um, so important to know, like if, if they're in fight or freeze, but I wanna say to answer the question, that when someone's suppressing their emotion, most likely they're shutting down. And that's what freeze is. Now, are they shutting down because they're afraid of what the alternative would be? Right? Are they shutting down because if they were to really talk about or experience or tell the story of the trauma, they're just going to go ballistic, ballistically angry, rageful. They're going to hurt somebody, right? So... To me, that just says that they are indeed stuck in a fight response, but freeze is what's helping them feel like they can manage that, right? And that is unfortunately something that a lot of us do. Yeah, we, we not only um, avoid or suppress, yeah, but we minimize, we rationalize. Those are all aspects of I need to freeze. I don't know what else to do with this. Remember that we go to freeze when, when your system has tried fighting and there hasn't been a resolution or when your system has tried fleeing and there hasn't been a resolution. Um, what gadgets do I recommend one have in the office? Well, I try to go through the, um, the what are the different resources Right, so I want to make sure that in my repertoire of gadgets that I have things that will help people to have more experiences of sensation. I have fabric, different kinds of fabric. I do have Play-Doh. I have rocks. I have crystals of things that people can actually hold on to that begins to create different sensations. I have oil essential oils, usually your basic lavender is a nice, right? Um, someone said peppermint candy is good. Peppermint candy for someone who likes sugar or wants, you know, something to, to play with and also eat, that, that can be 
Yeah. But the things that I have, I try not to have um, things that are edible just because that could be another way of just giving giving more energy to another coping mechanism that can be problematic for some people, and that is food or sugar. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to have some peppermints. You may have those clients who are like, okay, I just need something to bite into. But the things that I keep in my office are smells, things to touch, things with different density, um, things to, to uh, what's the word? There's a new word for this. It's not so new. Uh, but gadgets to play with, things that spin, things of that nature. Um, what else do I have in my office? I have music. So sometimes we'll play music. Um, oh, I see. The peppermint candy is about being able to smell it. Yeah. So peppermint oil, eucalyptic oil, those high energy oils, peppermint, eucalyptic, um, spearmint, things that have a big um, note are all oils that are good, particularly for people who are experiencing a sense of uh, freeze or dissociation. Um, I have pictures to look at, literally pictures, cards with pictures on them. Um, I have strange I just have a bunch of odds and ends, all of which clients can use. I hope that's helpful. And of course, if others have um, other ideas, please place them in the chat box. Uh, question, I assist with filing of order of protection, and that requires to retell the story. Any suggestions to lessen the trauma? Absolutely, slow it down, slow it down. That is the thing that we have to do. Slow down the story. And here's the thing, you know, clients are going to want to tell you the story. Sometimes rather quickly, because they're in that fight, flee, fight, flee, freeze response, where they want to get through it. They want to get, get it done, right? They want to get it done. And getting it done unconsciously is very, is very dangerous. So slow down the story, take your time. We've got plenty of time, whether you don't, whether you don't have time or, 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 or you do, you give a sense. You need to be regulated, by the way. Necesita ser regulado usted. Is this a break? Hay, hay un tiempo ahorita para cambiar. Eh, no sé, creo que sí. <laughs> Taylor, are we switching or is something we're, happening? Yes, I think we're pausing for a break for a moment. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thank you, Santa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we are good to go. Thank you. Estamos listos para empezar. Sí. Should I say yes? See, I don't know what I'm doing. I think you are good, Santa. Okay. Okay. Says he's switching. Good. <laughs> switching to the Spanish channel. Yeah. So again, back to the question of how best to receive client stories, if you can. And sometimes we just don't have it. Um, don't have the time, but if you can, to slow down the storytelling. Yeah, um, You can slow down the storytelling. You can ask for details of the story that are not as charged, right? So if in telling a story, the client is relaying something that happened, um, I don't know, something fell off the wall. Well, tell me about the thing that was on the wall. Okay. So you may want to ask for details that are not related to the actual moment of impact or the actual trauma experience, but are still part of the story. Um, but I would say that slowing it down, 
and encouraging some of the resources that can be readily available with breath. Also, um, I want to share, particularly uh, for those that um, may work with individuals who are in that free state, movement is so important, right? So encouraging your client to physically move, even if they go from this to this, any movement is going to help in this particular process. Yeah. So um, other questions or concerns about how best to support yourself and others in the system? I'd like to just open us up for other questions if you have them. Here's another question I'd like to ask. How many of you have resources? How many of you have things in your pocket that you know are automatic when I'm not feeling safe, when I am feeling disoriented or dysregulated? This thing always helps. Why don't you share some of those ideas, things that you do? Things that you know bring you back to a place of being able to breathe deeply and feel calmer and feel safer. Any thoughts? Yes, crystals and essential oils are great. Breathing, absolutely. Yeah. Also with the breathing, remembering that there are different types of breaths. So using breath that um, that's calming, that's slow, that's focused, as opposed to breaths that are more cleansing. And um, yeah, this person says walking outside, absolutely. I find that um, the other thing that I have in my office, even though it's central air and central heat is that I have a fan, sometimes having air blowing on you can be very, very resourceful for some people. For others, the idea that their hair touches their face is activating. So, you know, you offer it. Um, looking at the sky, looking at expansion, right? Absolutely. Uh, someone said uh, smooth stones or a blanket to touch. And that reminds me also of weighted blankets, something that feel that where I can feel that I am here because I feel the weight on me can be really helpful. Um, someone said they keep a smooth crystal in their pocket. Um, what if you get the client who turns down all suggested resources? Or when you ask them what resources have worked in the past, they cannot answer. Um, that is not an unusual response or an unusual engagement. When I have a client who says, nothing helps, I've tried everything and nothing helps. What I ask them to do is to think about, oh, sweet, someone's blowing bubbles out of the window. I'm sorry, got distracted there. That's a resource, bubbles. Um, I want to, really have a conversation with that person about how long has it been since they have felt that way, right? How long has it been? This is when I get into the, how long have you been that way? This is when I get to, when you have been in danger, what has been helpful? This is when I wanna to talk to them about rituals and practices. This is when I talk to them about, do they have a sense of faith? Is there a parental figure in their life? Or maybe the parental, you know, I've had clients who've actually said to me when I've said, can you remember a time when you've been, when you have felt safe? And they've said, no, I've never felt safe. How is it to be sitting here right now and look around? How is it to know that in this moment, in this tiny moment, that there's no danger here right now. And they'll go into 
telling me about all the ways in which, well, I don't know you. I don't know if someone's going to walk in. I don't know what's going to happen when I'm outside. But what about in this very moment, at this very moment? What happens if you take a deep breath? So these are the people where I'll spoon feed, I like saying, the things that I know help me or that I know help people in general. Um, and talking about the importance of identifying what are those things, no matter how many years ago it may have happened, no matter how um, uh, um, unrealistic it may be, right? So if you were to create, right? This is what I want to say to this person. Let's, Im let's imagine that the world is safe. What kind of a world would it be? What kind of spaces would there be? What kind of things do you need to protect yourself? This is where imagery and visualization come in really handy. Like you can create anything you need to be safe, right? And I want to encourage them to be as colorful, as imaginative, as whatever it is that they may need. Um, it's tough when you have people who, who say, nothing makes me feel safer, nothing makes me feel better. My work then is to, to help them create something and to explain, to give them, if you have time, the psycho ed around, it doesn't matter because people get into, well, that's not, it's not real. You want me to act as if, but it's not real. And I say, yeah, because your nervous system doesn't know that you're acting as if. As if. Yeah, so I hope that that's helpful. Um, any other thoughts or questions? So I hope that, um, that you all have plenty of resources in your pocket available to you, for you, for you, your energy and how um, regulated you seem definitely is gonna impact your client, yeah. So having plenty of support yourself, making sure that you're fit for the work, yeah? that you're taking deep breaths, that you're gently moving your body as to not get stuck, that you're putting lotion in your hands when you feel like you're drifting away, that you're smelling that oil, right? Making sure that you're well is part of our responsibility so that we can create spaces where others feel safer to step in. So I hope that you have found some of this, all of this helpful. And I know that um, Taylor mentioned earlier, if you have a question that you would rather not, um, not have it be out in the open, you can always send it directly to her and she'll share it with me. Um, but I think that's all I've got for now, unless people have other things they want to um, ask about or check in with. Yeah. Santa, this is Excuse me. The one uh, in the chat that's asking, um, what if there is a sexual assault or domestic violence victim who tells you, uh, who tells you they are not affected and everything is okay? Is it okay to just make sure they understand you are there for support? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, I have found, I mean, it depends on what your role is, right? If they're saying, I'm fine, this hasn't really affected me, then our job is to say, great, I trust that you know your body, and I trust that you know what safety feels like, right? That in and of itself is resourceful, to have someone come back and say, great, I trust you. I trust that you know, know that I'm here. If you should ever feel like some of these experiences are challenging to manage, right? And that's all we can do. However, if you are in the role of helping that person process, you're their therapist, or for whatever reason you have a relationship with them, then you could ask them a little bit more about 
the habitual responses. You can ask them about their behaviors, what, how they live, you know, what, um, by, by how they live. I mean, you can ask like, what, what do you normally respond to? How do you normally respond to conflict, to situations that you'd rather not be in? You know, you can help them to figure it out. But the reality is if someone's saying I'm well and their life appears to be well, right? They're not, I don't know, the thought that comes to me is they're not self-medicating, they're not hurting others, they're able to follow through and take care of themselves to find safety then that's wonderful. That is wonderful, right? We're not there to, to tell someone, no, no, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. It's going to hit you one of these days. No, it's okay. Whenever the memory or whenever the experience feels overwhelming, I'm here, right? And that's the other thing that I would do is to reassure people that the experience is in our bodies. And sometimes it shows up in ways that don't affect our everyday life. And sometimes it shows up in aches and pains. And as I said earlier, and emotional, um, emotional behaviors that are not really helpful. But if you're happy, things are working for you, then by all means, we want to encourage that. You've been listening and viewing Elevate Uplift's Community Dialogue Series. Elevate Uplift is supported by a collective of national organizations and Circle of Wisdom members leading anti-sexual violence work and includes the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, the National Organization of Asians and Pacific Islanders Ending Sexual Violence, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, the Resource Sharing Project, and our Circle of Wisdom members who provide us with direction, expertise, connections, and influence. For more information, please visit www.elevateuplift.org.